Bethany Lutheran in Warren, Oregon. Today I'm preaching on 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this, when he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is, and all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. C.S. Lewis once wrote, that too often we think that what sanctification is, that it's all about taking a race horse and training it to run just a little faster than it used to run. In actuality, Lewis noted, what happens to us as believers once we become engrafted onto Christ is not like taking a regular old horse and teaching it to run faster, but more like taking a horse, outfitting it with a pair of wings, and teaching the creature to fly. The saved in Christ is not just any old life made a little bigger or brighter or some such thing. It is to take a human life and transform it into a whole new mode of existence. On this All Saints Sunday, we are looking at God the Father's love for us and the sanctification that comes from that love. The sanctification that transforms us into a whole new existence. Our first John lesson starts off with, see what kind of love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. As if it were not enough that the eternal Father of all creation would call us his children, but as Ephesians 2 verses 4 and 5 tell us, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in sin. It is by grace you have been saved. When we are the farthest from God, which also means we're in spiritual danger, he calls us the loudest to allow him, for us to allow him to love us, to show his mercy to us, to bestow his grace upon us. And that makes sense. For instance, if our son or daughter is out on the battlefield, we pray harder than ever for their protection and safe return. When our spouse gets that dreaded diagnosis, we find ourselves crying out to God to heal them and to give us supernatural strength to walk beside them with the greatest support we can muster. So we can understand at least a bit the depth of love one can feel for someone dear to us. But then try to imagine feeling a deep yearning love for someone who avoids you, who repeatedly turns their back on you, who uses your name as a curse word. That love can wear out. It can reach a limit, a place of no return. It's called divorce, abandonment, writing him or her out of the will. God's love for you never reaches the point of divorce. It is at that time that it calls all the louder. 
It's that kind of love that can make a saint out of a perpetual sinner. It's that kind of love that initiates the sanctification process. When we become a Christian, when we accept Jesus' offer to be our Savior, God starts us on the sanctification process. When this happens, we no longer desire to sin boldly, but we do not automatically give up all sin. Gordon MacDonald, in his book, Ordering Your Private World, told of an experience in his life that illustrates this truth. Some years ago, when Gail and I bought the old abandoned New Hampshire farm we now call Peace Lodge, we found the site where we wished to build our country home strewn with rocks and boulders. It was going to take a lot of hard work to clear it out. The first phase of the clearing process was easy. Those big boulders went fast. But when they were gone, we began to see there was a lot of smaller rocks that had to go too. But when we had cleared the site of the boulders and the rocks, we noticed all the stones and pebbles that we had not seen before. This was much harder, more tedious work. But we stuck to it, and there came the day when the soil was ready for planting grass. When we clear the coarse words spoken in anger from our vocabulary, then we can hear God ask, but what about the words you speak in gossip? When we stop cheating on our taxes and business contracts, God points out that when we write our check for the church offering, we carefully decide how little we can give rather than how much we can give. We say that we give our lives to Jesus because we give up our weekend bar hopping. But then he points out that we prioritize Monday nights for baseball, Sunday afternoons for football, and Saturday mornings for golf. But we do fit God time into an hour on Sunday morning if it's not hunting season or time for the salmon run, and if there's no really good estate sales, you know, if we don't have anything else to do. The process of sanctification is a lifelong journey, often consisting of two steps forward and one step back. The good news is that at the end, Jesus makes up the difference. As verse 2 tells us, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. We are God's children, not his pets, not his best friends, not playthings to manipulate at will. We are God's children, adopted through the water and word of our baptism. Children are heirs. When we inherit that which belongs to the Father, we inherit access to heaven. We inherit a renewed earth. We inherit eternal life in the Father's presence. And what does that inheritance look like? Well, we don't know exactly. We cannot imagine even what a restored, flawless earth will look like because we have never seen such a thing. And heaven in its grandeur is definitely beyond our understanding. I think I see two reasons why God does not tell us exactly what life in heaven will look like. First, our minds are too corrupted, too blemished to understand perfection. A detailed description of heaven would require words beyond our vocabulary. It has colors and sounds never encountered this side of death. In 2 Corinthians 12, verses 2 through 4, Paul writes, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. 
And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise. He heard inexpressible things, things that man is not permitted to tell. Those who have gotten a glimpse of heaven through a near-death experience can only tell of the purity of the light, the incredible warmth, the feeling of intense love and joy, the presence of colors never seen before. And then they stop, for they have no adequate words. Second, perhaps God does not give us more details because he wants us to respond to his love for us, not for the inheritance. We've been told enough to make our minds up to either follow Jesus or follow the ways of the world. And that is sufficient for now. After all, he has promised to love us no matter what, to forgive every confessed sin, to walk beside us and support us in all circumstances, to adopt us as his children, in other words, to give us an equal share as Jesus, his son, has received. To give us complete healing, body and soul. To cleanse us from all unrighteousness. To invite us to a heavenly banquet. To restore unity in our relationships with others. To reunite us with our loved ones. And he has promised us Jesus to pray for us in our times of trouble. With all that already given to us, should God have to show us heaven as well for us to decide whether we want to follow him or follow the evil one? Really? C.S. Lewis also wrote, we think becoming a disciple after baptism is like God coming into the house of our hearts and putting up some new drapes and slapping on a few new coats of paint on the same old walls. In reality, God comes in, knocks down most of the walls, and starts to build something brand new. I'm counting on God's renewal and restoration promises. I will no longer need glasses and my teeth will not have more silver and gold than enamel. My hip won't clunk and my knee won't creak. I will once again have more hair on top of my head than on my chin, and my face will once again be up where it started out in life, and I will no longer have to search for my lost memory. And those are just the superficial benefits. For the first time, I will be able to understand pure, selfless love. I will learn how one can fully forgive and forget personal offenses. I will live in bliss with no painful memories. When someone is adopted, he severs his ties with his former family. He now lives in a whole new context with a new name, a new identity, and a new inheritance. God has called us into an adoption relationship. He gives us a whole new way of living life. A brand new name, beloved. A new identity as a child of God. And an inheritance of life eternal in paradise. On this All Saints Sunday, may we celebrate with our departed loved ones and the saints of old, the new life in Christ Jesus and another day in paradise. Amen. Mm -hmm.